Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we're so grateful to come into your house tonight. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. God, we're excited about your presence and what you want to do in this place tonight. Lord, with expectancy, we come and uh, with joy in our hearts, God, and expectation of what you're going to do, God, we invite you and welcome you to have your way, God. Have your way in us, Lord, in our hearts and lives individually. God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, God. We'll give you our attention, our interest, God. We'll do our part, and we know that you'll do your part. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, as we look forward to what's gonna take place next week, God, we do pray for the pastor's gathering, that you bless it, encourage these pastors, and bless them, God. Tonight, bless all the churches that are preaching the gospel, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, God. Many are having midweek services right now, God. We bless them. God, if they're lifting up the name of Jesus and preaching your gospel, your truth, God, we bless them as you would bless us. Also, Father, we do remember those around the world that are scattered abroad, persecuted throughout, God. We pray that you encourage them and strengthen them. May they endure to the end, God. And Lord, we love you and we give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Amen. Tonight, grab your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 John. We're going to be in 1 John. We're launching out from 1 John chapter number 2. If I was to title the message tonight, I would call it Protecting the Anointing. And we're going to find out what that means as we go throughout the Word of God tonight, how to do that. Very important for all of us in our lives that we not only understand what the anointing is, but we also understand how we can protect the anointing. First John chapter 2, I want to take a look at verse number 27. First John chapter number 2, verse 27 says this, but the anointing, everybody say anointing. anointing. The anointing which you have received from him, capital H, speaking of God, that God gave us an anointing. The anointing you have received from him abides in you. That word abide simply means this, lives, stays, dwells, okay? Very important that we understand what that means because that's going to teach us something about the anointing. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. Now notice, not only does the anointing live, stay, and dwell in you, but it teaches you all things, and then it goes on and it says, and is true. Everybody say true. Amen. We're going to build on that thought that the anointing is true. And it also says this, and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide, live, stay, and dwell where? In him. So we see from this verse that the anointing has a specific purpose in our lives. God has given us an anointing to live, to stay, and to dwell in us. This anointing also teaches us concerning all things. Now, when we see that, all things means what? Some of you guys got that, okay? All things means what? All things means all things. Plain and simple. It's very easy truth from the Word of God. And, and the anointing is true and is not a lie. And therefore, that anointing helps us, has taught us, and we abide in Him. In other words, that anointing is our helper. It's helping us to have a relationship with God helping us to stay with our life lived in God, helping us to connect with God. Now, the anointing is, if you study this out, the Holy Spirit in our lives. God has given us the Holy Spirit. Maybe you didn't realize it, maybe you didn't know it, but when you were born again, if you were born in the Spirit of God in this place, God gave you an anointing. God gave you the Holy Spirit. He is the gift that was given to the church. He comes and he lives on the inside of us. There's a great exchange that's made. Our dead life for his living power, for his living word, for the Spirit of Christ. Now his life comes on the inside of us and raises us from the dead. And now we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, but now we have the Holy Spirit of God that lives on the inside of us. Now, I don't know how that works. I don't understand all that, how I can be here in this natural flesh earth suit and yet be seated with Christ in heavenly places all at the same time, but it's a reality that we live in spiritually. And in the same token, I don't understand how the God of the universe can take his spirit, the one who fills the universe, the heavens, who stretches out the heavens with his hands, this great, mighty, magnificent God, how his spirit can live on the inside of us. I mean, that's just a little hard, isn't it? Can't be much bigger than my fist. And yet, 
God lives on the inside of us, each and every one of us. God is not only God over the universal scale, but but the micro scale of our lives and our hearts. And therefore, he saw fit that he wasn't going to stay and live and dwell in a temple made with hands by man. No, God himself was going to come and live in our hearts. And now we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we have this anointing. We have this Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He teaches us. Remember, we just prayed right now, and we said, truly, the teacher of the church, not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine, the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. So we have this Holy Spirit, we have this teacher, and he teaches us concerning all things. All things means all things. In our life, if you ever have a problem, you ever have a trial, you ever have pressure, you ever need wisdom, you ever want to know about life, about parenting, about finances, about uh, your future, want to know about love and marriage, and want to know about respect and relationships, whatever it is that you need to know about, you have an anointing. In other words, you can just ask the Holy Spirit, what do I do with this? How does this work? What's the plan? In fact, it even works in business. Uh, George Washington Carver, an inventor, um, I mean, invented all sorts of dyes and paints and uh, laminates and all this different stuff, oils and different things, all because he asked God about the, you know, God, give me, give me the, the uh, wisdom uh, of the universe. And God says, no, the universe is too big for you. He says, then, then just give me the peanut, God. Out of that came all these inventions and all this stuff that, that we know and enjoy today. Scientific advancement, all because he had a relationship with the anointing, the Holy Spirit who taught him. Same thing in our lives. If you ever have a problem, you ever have a question, ever need to go further or or, or need to know something about life, you can ask the Holy Spirit. You can just pray, say, Father, I need some wisdom. God, I pray that you give it to me. Holy Spirit, I'm listening for your voice. Show me. We'll take a look at that in the Word of God and see how that works. Now, maybe you've heard this in church. Maybe you've heard, man, the anointing was there. You ever hear that when you go to church, man, that that praise and worship was anointed? Or, gosh, man, the preacher was just like a machine gun. That guy is anointed to preach. Anybody ever hear something like that, right? It's kind of churchese, you know what I mean? You hear that in church circles. Really what they're saying is that the Spirit of God is on that thing. And, And probably the best definition I've ever heard when the anointing is used in that sense is that of painting, painting a wall, if you will, right? Let's say you you have a a white wall, just kind of drab, boring, hospital white wall. Now, some people are into that. So if that's what you like, then, then, hey, cool. But there are those of us that like color, right, in the world, and and, and we enjoy that. And so maybe you take a, a warm tone and you put that on the wall. Now, all of a sudden, your cold living room, right, hospital living room, now all of a sudden it turns into a warm and welcome and inviting place. If I could still line from HGTV, it went from drab to fab, right? You guys get that? Okay, thank you, Pastor. Now I know what you're talking about. But why did that happen? Because there was something that was painted on. There was something that was applied to that wall that now took it from being okay to being something that is different, something that's improved, something that's better. In our lives, when the anointing of God is applied to our life, when God anoints us, when we're anointed with the Holy Spirit, when now all of a sudden we have this anointing that teaches us, we have this anointing that lives and stays and dwells in us, we have this anointing that shows us how to live life in Him, now it takes our lives from ordinary and it changes it to extraordinary. You guys listening tonight? See, in the Old Testament, they would anoint the kings and priests. You heard about that, right? Samuel anointed David as king. Now, on the outside, David goes back to the sheep. We don't really think anything happened. But spiritually and supernaturally, David at that moment was now changed from a little shepherd boy on the hills of Judea now to the king of Israel in God's eyes. There were times where the anointing of God would come upon people and they would be able to prophesy. They'd be able to do mighty works. They would have victories and things that happened in their lives, all because the anointing was upon them. See, they were changed. That anointing, that painting took them from dull and boring, right? Now, all of a sudden, to extraordinary and awesome, all because of the anointing, the priests, right? God took it so seriously with the priest. He said, you should consecrate yourselves. And, and to some of the priests, he told them, don't leave your service in the tabernacle because you carry the anointing oil of God on your head. Now, in the Old Testament, it was all a picture. It was all an example for us today in the New Testament church. Now that the Holy Spirit has come, we see that that anointing is representing the Holy Spirit. Now, in church today, you will still see us use anointing oil. Like this past Sunday night, 
we anointed everybody in the building and some of the people that weren't in the building, right? We just slapped oil on everybody because we were praying the protection and the blessing of God over families. And so we took that anointing oil and we applied it. We rubbed it on the head. We smeared it. We, we put it on the heads and the foreheads of the people. What were we doing? We were representing that God would now be upon them for a certain blessing and for protection in their lives, according to the will and the promise of God that we find in the Bible, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. As we prayed, we anointed them, and they went out, and now they carry that anointing in their lives. Is it because the oil was applied? No, it's because the Spirit of God is on that. Also, you see us sometimes when we pray or we commission people for service, right? We will anoint them before we send them into that service, whether it be to the mission field, whether it be ordination as a minister. We will take the oil of anointing, and we will place it on their foreheads, and now, whereas they may have been ministering here, they may have been, uh, you know, serving, or they may have been in business, something like that, that anointing is applied to them, and now they are commissioned for service, and we send them out for that specific purpose. See, what happened was the anointing is now applied, and now they are changed from what they were into something now they're prepared for service. That's what we see in the New Testament. And it's our job not to just know that. See, if all we did was just know that, that'd be a pretty boring sermon right now, wouldn't it? You all would have left this church tonight and said, hmm, I may have learned something, but did that really do anything for me? You know, I, I guess I'll go home and, and uh, cap off a, a whole box of ice cream and finish that off watching some late night television and burp and go to bed and that would be about the end of it, right? But see, God doesn't want us just to know something. God wants us to operate in his truth. And so God doesn't just give us these great examples in the Old Testament and give us commandments in the New Testament and, and have scripture verses like we just read that you have an anointing that teaches you concerning all things for us just to know. No, God wants us to live that out. God wants us to operate in that. God wants us to flow with the anointing. God wants us to live, stay, and dwell in him. That's the point of that verse. Because as you learn about life and you realize what true life is all about, you realize that life is only true life when it's lived in God, when it's lived in Him. And therefore, the anointing is continually leading us to Jesus. Jesus is continually revealing the Father. And because of that, now that anointing is keeping us in a communion and in a connection with God in all times and all places. So it's very important that we protect that anointing. Very important that we don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Very important that we acknowledge the work of God in our lives. See, even though that verse talks about the anointing and it uses the term it, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. And as a person, we can actually grieve his heart, the Bible says. We can actually quench the Spirit of God. We can, we can receive that Spirit, that anointing, in vain, the Bible says. And therefore, we need to not work against, we don't want to quench, we don't want to grieve. No, I want more of the Spirit of God in my life. I want to have the presence of God. I want to have that anointing. I don't want a drab life. I want a fab life. I want to have a life that God has paid the price for me to live, be all that he's called me to be, and do all that he's called me to do. And I know it's no different in your life. So tonight, I want to talk to you about protecting the anointing. A couple of things that we can do in the natural to flow with the anointing, to stay in the presence of God, to, to work with the Holy Spirit. How can we protect the anointing? I've got that question for you up on the overheads. We'll, we'll answer that question a couple of times tonight. Three different things that we're going to take a look at on how we can protect the anointing. First one is this, is we've got to guard our hearts. If we're going to protect the anointing, we have to guard our hearts. The Bible says to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Think about it this way. Remember we said that when you were born again, if you're born again of the Spirit of God, you're now a Christian, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes and he lives, he stays, and he dwells in your heart, right? That's now the home of the Holy Spirit is your heart. And as the home of the Holy Spirit, don't you think if God is your house guest, living in your house, that your house should be clean? Right? I mean, think about it. If Jesus came and appeared to you in a vision in the middle of the night and said, I'm coming to your house tomorrow, I will be there at 9 a.m. I'm going to knock on the door, and I'm going to give you this knock right here. And you'll know it's me. See you tomorrow at 9 
listen for the knock. You'd wake up from the dream, what would you do? You'd just go back to sleep? No, you'd be scrubbing those floors, you would be sweeping, you'd be yelling at the kids, get up, I don't care if it's 2 a.m., son, go clean that room, and I want you to get under the bed, right, clean the toilet, and I want you to get around the edges, just in case he goes in there, right? Telling your daughter, clean that closet out. You have shoved all of your school projects in there from six years ago. Get them out of here. Why? Because Jesus is coming to the house. See, the Holy Spirit lives in your house. And therefore, the house needs to be clean. You say, well, how do I clean that up? Well, the Bible tells us it's our responsibility. Purify yourselves as he is pure. We are the doorkeepers. Jesus told us that the eye is the lamp of the body, that if if darkness is going in and all you got in here is darkness, how great is that darkness? So we need to be careful. We need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our lives. Let's take a look at it in the Word of God together. You're there in the book of 1 John. Turn me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 4. And in Ephesians chapter number 4, I want to take a look A couple of verses. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 20 through verse number 24, and then we'll drop down to verse number 30. Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul's writing to the Ephesian church, and he's telling them some things about life, talking to them about their new life in Christ, telling them some things that they should look for, some things that they should look out for, stuff to do, stuff not to do. How it looks when you are a Christian, how it looks when you're not a Christian. He's contrasting. And as he goes through this, and he's talking about all this kind of stuff, talking about their life before Christ and now uh, the people that are outside of, of God, now verse number 20, he says this, but you have not so learned Christ. Now, I want you to notice something. You have not so learned Christ. What was the first thing that the anointing did for us? It lived, stayed, and dwelled on the inside of us, right? Second thing that the anointing did was what? Teach us, right? You have not so learned Christ. Verse number 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now remember the anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true, right? So if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Verse number 22. That you put off. Everybody say put off. Do you know that this is your choice? You can either do this or you can't do this. You can choose what you have on. You can choose what you wear. You can either wear the anointing of God in your life or you can choose to not wear it. So he says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You know what that is? That's a dirty house. He says put that off. You don't have to wear that old, raggedy, dirty house any longer. You don't have to have those white walls with the fingerprints all over them from the grimy little kids, right? You don't have to have that blood stain on there anymore. You don't have to have the dirty stuff in your your house. You don't have to have the couch that's dingy and, and when you smack it, the dust comes flying out. You can put all that stuff off and take a look at what he says in the next verse and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on, verse 24, put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So he says you can choose what it is that you're wearing. You can either wear that old man, that old way of life, that old sinful, dirty, filthy person, that shameful person. You can wear that around. You can But listen, if the Holy Spirit has come and lived on the inside of you, if you've learned about Jesus, you know that you have that anointing, and that anointing is true because the truth is in Christ Jesus, then you don't have to live like that any longer. You can guard your heart, and you can put off that old man, and now you can put on the new man. How does that happen? He says, by the renewing of your mind. That is, you get the word of God on the inside of you, and the anointing teaches you, hey, this is how you should walk. This is how you should live. You don't have to be in bondage to that. You're not addicted to that. That may be something in the natural, but now you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
Now you can put that thing down. Now you don't have to have the bottle anymore. You are no longer a slave to your passions and your lust and your, your desires. Now you are a slave to righteousness and you've been recreated. Those desires are ungodly and you don't have to give in to them any longer. Now you're free from those things. Now you're free to serve Christ. You're free to live. You're free to love. Your past has been forgiven. And now you can put on that new man and you can host the Holy Spirit in a clean house. Are you listening? Now drop down to verse number 30. Okay, he continues to talk about some things that they should be careful of, uh, some conduct things. I would encourage you guys, if you have not read this section of Scripture, a great section of Scripture, read through that and take a look at that. Verse number 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. See, in the same section of Scripture where he's talking about putting off that old man and putting on the new man, he, what does he say when he finishes all of it? He starts talking about lying, starts talking about the words of our mouth, starts talking about lust and all this other stuff. And he says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Remember the priests that had the anointing oil on their heads. He says, you guys don't come out of the temple. Why? Because you wear the anointing of God. In the same way in our lives, we cannot go back to the sinful lifestyles that we once lived. Why? Because we wear the anointing of God on our heads. Now, before anybody hangs their head in shame and thinks pastor is preaching about them, can I tell you something? Pastor is preaching about pastor too, okay? I may be anointed to preach this, but I'm no more anointed to live this than you are. We're all in this together. And so we all have to take a look at our lives and say, what was that thing that was holding me back? Well, what is that thing that's trying to raise its ugly head and, and you know, that, that night of the living dead thing? What is that sin that's trying to resurrect in my life? I'm going to cast down those imaginations. I'm not going to allow that thing to come up in my life. I, I'm not going to give in to the desires of the flesh. Why? Because the old man's gone, and I wear the anointing of God on myself now. I am sealed for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Protecting the anointing. First one is guard our hearts. Second thing is this. Guard our lives from contamination. Now, you might say, well, pastor, how is that any different from number one, right? Guard our hearts, guard our lives, you know. Isn't, isn't that the same thing? It's different in the sense of this. The anointing teaches us, right? Now, it's one thing in, in, in your, your life with the struggle with sin. But there are things that can creep into our lives that we'll accept because we maybe are deceived. Sometimes we accept them because we justify them. Sometimes we accept them because that's the way that it is around us. But the anointing is wanting to teach us a new way. He's wanting to teach us God's way. And therefore, if we can watch what's going on up here in our thinking, then our thinking will channel into our doing. Are you listening? Because everything that we do is first conceived up here in the mind. Okay? So the anointing teaches us, we don't have to make up our own minds as to what is right or wrong anymore. We have the anointing that will teach us what is right and wrong. Think about that for a second. We don't have to make that decision any longer. The pressure's off. You don't have to make that decision. All you have to do is listen for the anointing. Is this what you want, God? Holy Spirit, I don't know whether or not I should do this. What do you think? Share with me your heart on this matter. See, and as you do that, you will receive the pure truth from God's word and from the spirit of God. Why? Because he is true, right? So therefore, we don't have to go around and take a look at what society's doing. You don't have to go back to your old school books and see what the education system taught you any longer. You don't have to go and look at what the news channels, whether it be Fox or CNN, listen, both of them are all messed up, all right? Come on, somebody. Listen, we got to stop looking to the television to teach us how to live life. That is polluted with worldliness and, and, and with all sorts of other filth. And yet in our lives, all we got to do, if you want to know about life, if you want to know about godliness, if you want to know how to please the Lord, if you want to know how to live a great life, don't listen to the pollution of the world. Stay out of that because it will contaminate you and it will get you off and your house will eventually end up dirty again. But all you got to do is listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. What is it, Lord? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? What do you think about that, God? See, you, it, it's not a sin to watch the news. But when you're watching the news and you see something that comes up and there's a question there, Father, what do you think? See, you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit now that you can talk to the Holy Spirit each and every day. 
remember early on in my Christian walk, I'd hear people talking about they heard from God this, they, they talked to God about that. And, you know, in my prayer time, it, was, it seemingly was just one way. And I always felt like, man, I must be not that great of a Christian because I don't hear God like other people hear him. But when I got a hold of the fact that the Holy Spirit, how he operates, who he is, how he speaks into my life, how he reveals the scriptures to me, oh my goodness, all of a sudden I realized, man, Holy Spirit just, he doesn't shut up. He's talking all the time. Every morning I wake up, Holy Spirit, good morning, and he's right there. Good morning, I was waiting for you to get up. I want to talk to you about your life. See, it will keep you from being contaminated by the things of this world. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, look at what it says. I'll just put up on the overhead for time's sake. It says, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. See, there is a wisdom of this world. There is a way of the world that people think is sound wisdom. And we have operated in those ways so long that when the teaching of the Holy Spirit comes along, and now all of a sudden you hear from the Word of God, this is the way that it should be, we have a hard time connecting with this. Why? Because we've been entrenched in the way of the world. But look at this. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches. See, we're not teaching natural principles. This is not just, you know, positive thinking message. This is not some psycho-cybernetics, new age guru goofball type thing. This is not just, you know, uh, the, the logical conclusion or the way of the world because you can add it up and you can calculate it. No, we compare spiritual things with spiritual. This is God's wisdom which the Holy Spirit teaches. And it makes sense to us because we have tuned our hearts, we've renewed our minds, and we recognize and realize things like faith, things like love, things like the kingdom of God, things like the power of God. We understand grace. We understand all these things outside of the natural realm now. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. See, we've got to stay unpolluted from the world's wisdom. Think about it like this. If I was baking cookies and I had... My cookie sheet, I had, you know, the dough, and I had chocolate chips, and I had a kitty litter box right there up on the countertop next to the ingredients. How many of you would want some cookies from my house? I didn't see any hands go up. Okay, I I got it, I got it. But what if I was making smoothies and I had all my ingredients there? I had oranges, I had apples, I had bananas, I had yogurt, I had grass from my yard. I had sand from the kids' play box. How many of you want a smoothie? I didn't see any hands go up. See why? Because that's contaminated, that's polluted. And yet we look at our lives and we want to do business. But we end up doing it the world's way. I'm sorry. But that's contaminated. We want to do marriage. And we bring everything else into our marriages, and we don't do it God's way, and we expect to have a great marriage. But I'm sorry, that's polluted with the world's way. See, we've got to get a hold of the anointing. The anointing will teach you. The anointing will show you. He will remind you of the word of God. That's part of the Holy Spirit's job description. We'll take a look at that later on. But, you know, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything Jesus spoke. My goodness, you know, Jesus is the word. He is the logos. He is the entire whole counsel of the word of God. The spirit of God will just whisper a scripture in your ear. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will set you up for success. Every area of your life. Turn to the book of James. Right after the book of Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. James chapter number three. I want to take a look at this worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. James chapter number 3, I want to take a look at verse 13 through verse number 17. James chapter 3, verse number 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. So he says, your life is going to show who's really wise by how you live your life. Now, just in case we didn't understand what he was talking about, he goes on in verse number 14. But if you have bitter envy... And self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast against, boast and lie against the truth. Verse 15, this wisdom, everybody say this wisdom. Yes. See, notice he said, let his works be done in the meekness of wisdom. But now he starts talking about self-seeking, bitter envy, and he says this wisdom. So in other words, he's 
drawing a line and he's showing us there is two different kinds of systems operating here. There is a wisdom of the world and there is a wisdom of God. So he says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Now, it would be shocking if you came into the church service tonight and I told you sex outside of marriage is demonic. Some of you guys would want to drag me out and stone me because you'd say, why is it demonic? It may be wrong, it might be sin, but demonic, I mean, that's a little harsh, isn't it, Pastor? But if I told you that sex outside of marriage is earthly, you might be able to agree with me on that, right? Well, yeah, I, I guess that's the way people in the world do it. They have that mentality that you've got to kick the tires and slam the doors before you buy a car, so why not try out your spouse, right? <laughs> Can we talk? This is an adult church service, okay? The kids are getting ministered to over there, all right? That's why you all drop them off, hopefully. But we're talking about a, this adult church. This is adult Bible study. So if I said that's earthly, you all would say, yeah, that's the, that's the mentality people have out there in the world. Now, does God say that that's okay? No. He says, no, you should get married, and then you can enjoy the pleasures of a sexual relationship between a husband and a wife in your marriage because there is a covenant now. The two have become one flesh. You'll remember this, no ding ding without a ring ring, okay? I can see it on Twitter. Don't do it. Okay? So then he goes on, he says, it's earthly, and I could say, sex outside of marriage is sensual. You all would say, well, hey, come on, pastor, yeah, of course it is. But notice that if it's earthly and it's sensual, look at, this wisdom does not descend from above. So he says, this wisdom is earthly, is sensual, and is demonic. In other words, when you operate in those earthly and sensual ways, when it's bitterness, it's self Seeking, which a lot of times, those sorts of things that we do out there in the world that we did before we were saved and that continue to try and come on us, we don't recognize and we don't realize it's earthly, it's sensual, and it's inspired by Satan in the demonic realm. There is an oppression that's coming against us and we play into it. And then we're riddled with guilt afterwards. And that's just what the devil wants because he wants you to run from God rather than run to God. See, if you messed up, it's time to repent. It's time to clean the house. It's time to say, you know what, I'm getting rid of that stuff that's dragging me down. I'm going to cut off those relationships that are hindering my walk with God. I'm going to repent. You know what, repentance, it's not a dirty word. A lot of times people think repentance, oh, we, you know, or, or maybe that's just a one-time thing that you did when you got saved. And if you continue to sin afterwards, you're just a reprobate. You might as well go off and do your own thing. No, listen, repentance is, I was going this way. I was doing my own thing. I recognized it. I realized it. I changed my mind to go towards God's way. And I went back to the Lord confessed my sin and said, God, I'm going to change. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's repentance. It's so simple. It's so easy. And listen, I do it every day because thoughts come in. I, I get mad about something and say something. Somebody does something and I, and I think something, you know, constantly things coming against us. There are trials. There are temptations. The devil is attacking and so repentance is something we need in our lives. Why? Because there is a wisdom of this earth, and we can get deceived and think, I should be doing this. We can be self-seeking and say, I deserve this. We can justify it and say, you know what, the government this, or the people that, or, or they made me do it because they made me mad. And we can get into those things. But he says, that wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So what does the wisdom of God look like? Next verse. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Isn't that great? You know if it's wisdom from God when it's pure. Why? Because the anointing is true. There's nothing contaminating or polluting. It is pure. Then peaceable. So you know that if, if you were thinking, man, I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind, probably not the wisdom from above, right? Gentle. Oh, my, my, my. See, when you're about ready to come down on your children, you can discipline, but you can do that in a spirit of gentleness. In a way that you do. That's why the Bible says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. There is discipline. You draw the line. You do what you got to do with discipline, that sort of a thing. My goodness. You, the state of California says you can spank that butt. Go ahead. All right? But don't provoke your children to wrath. 
Come back with love afterwards. Talk to them about it. Be gentle with them. They're little. They don't understand. Willing to yield. I can't tell you, just yesterday, my wife and I, we had a knockdown, drag out, blow up fight. <laughs> Partway through the argument, all of a sudden, I realized, I'm shouting. I don't know why. And, and, I, and I figured it out. I was just under some stress and some pressure, and something that she said about me made me mad. And so I was fighting about that. And she realized something that I said about her made her mad. So we're fighting about two totally different things. Now, you know what I did? I lowered my voice. I pulled up a chair. I sat down, and I talked really quietly. You know what she did? She straightened up in her chair. She lowered her voice, and we had a good conversation. And then we went and we told our kids, did you guys hear what mommy and daddy were yelling about? And they said, yes. I think the neighbors did too, mom and dad. <laughs> you know. But we sat down and we talked to them about it. See, willing to yield. Look at what it says. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. See, we can know what the wisdom of God is. You can know what the anointing is. You can know what God is teaching you and what God is saying to you. we got to move on. I'd love to spend some more time on that, but you have the anointing that can teach you more about that. And God, good. Number three for tonight is this. How do we protect the anointing? Number one, we got to guard our hearts. Number two, guard our lives from contamination. Number three, guard against the enemy. Listen, the devil is real, okay? He's not a fairy tale. He's, he's not a lie. The devil is out there. Him and his host are, are after you. They don't like you. In fact, they hate you. And it's been years that the serpent has been trying to destroy the seed of the woman. That's been something that's been going on since the onset of humanity and of time. Because the devil hates God. And now God lives on the inside of you. And you are marked by God with an anointing. Therefore, the devil has marked you as snake fodder. He wants to devour you, devour your life, steal, kill, and destroy. He's going to lie to you, try and deceive you into false thinking. He's going to tell you that you're crazy. He's going to tell you that, no, you shouldn't worry about this or, or that you're okay and that you shouldn't be doing anything. Why are you going to church so much? Why are you giving so much? Why are you serving so much? You're just fine where you're at. See, the devil's going to bring all sorts of lies and try and get you into confusion. But remember, that's worldly, earthly, sensual, and demonic. And therefore, we need to press on and press past, and we need to fight the good fight of faith to protect the anointing in our lives. See, I remember an old story. Maybe you guys have heard this, and I've heard it told several different ways, and I don't really know where it's from, but I heard about a man who was getting ready to cross a bridge. As he was getting ready to cross the bridge, there was a little snake on the bridge, and the snake said, excuse me, sir, uh, you know, this bridge is, is a rope bridge, and it has the wooden planks, and I'm just so little here that I really can't get across the bridge. Would you pick me up and carry me across? Now, the man was wise, and he said, well, you know, Mr. Snake, you're talking to me here, and, uh, you know, you're, you're kind. They bite people. And if I pick you up and carry you across, you're going to bite me. And the snake says, I promise. I, I know that my kind have done that to your kind, and, uh, you know, I, I really just need to get across to the other side, and if you would, please carry me across. I promise that I, I won't bite you. And so after a while, considering the man said, you, you better promise, you better, you know, swear that you're not going to bite me. Snake said, I swear. You have my word on it. So the man picked up the snake, walked him across the bridge to the other side. Upon reaching the other side, the snake bit the man right there on the hand and dropped to the ground. Now, as the man was feeling the venom and the poison going into his body and uh, gasping for breath on the ground, he looked at the snake with unbelief, and he said, but you promised. How could you do this? And the snake looked back at him, and he said, I'm still a snake. <laughs> See, we think sometimes that we can make a deal with the devil. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. The devil says, okay. Come on, somebody. I won't bite you. And we say, all right, and we turn our back, and guess what? He's still a snake. And we have to guard against the devil. We have to guard against deception. We have to guard against lies and the attack of the enemy. See, sometimes we say, oh, no, I feel all oh, the seasons changing. I feel, a, a, <coughs> I feel a cough coming on. Oh, my, my sinuses, I just got sinusitis every time. That, listen, you are claiming what the devil wants to bite you with. The devil is a liar. 
And he's the father of lies. And you don't have to put up with that. You don't have to claim it. No, you can declare the truth of God's word and let the anointing of God remind you that by his stripes, I was healed. I don't have to have seasonal allergies. I don't have to put up with this. I don't have to have cancer. I don't care if my mommy, my daddy, my grandpappy, and everybody else in the line had cancer before me or heart problems or any sort of other disease. It doesn't matter that your daddy might have been a drunk, your granddaddy might have been a drunk, all your uncles were drunks. You don't have to be bound. See, the level's go devil's going to try and lie to you. Tell him to take a hike. Remind him of the, the word of God has said. John chapter 16, verse 13. We'll end with this tonight. John chapter 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13 says this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says this. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. It's part of the Holy Spirit's job description to remind us of what Jesus has said. But I want you to notice he is the spirit of truth. See, if you want to know what's truth and what's a lie, what's a counterfeit, what's of God and what's of the devil, all you have to do is study the truth. You know, bankers, when they're studying and, and, and they're, they're studying money, they look at what real money looks like. And they know real money so well, they feel it, they touch it, they take a look at the colors. There's watermarks, there's all sorts of different things in there that show them that that is a real dollar. And they don't teach them about counterfeits, they teach them about the real dollar so that when a counterfeit comes across, they may not see it, but oh, they feel it. No, that's, that's not real, that's, that's a counterfeit. They, they, they may not feel it, but when they look at it, they'll know, wait a second, something's missing here. So, something's not right here. See, in our lives, we need to study the truth. We need to make sure that we know the word of God, that we know the anointing of God. And we protect the anointing of God so that when the lie comes along and the devil comes knocking, we say, wait, wait a second, that doesn't feel right. Wait, oh, hold on, let me look at that for a second. That, that doesn't look right. Hold on, let me listen to, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like what I know that the Spirit has taught me. We can protect the anointing. And as you do, life comes alive. The word of God comes alive. Every morning, you wake up and you've got a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, as you're going on the job, he's telling you what to do, how to do it. You're making money. You're believing God for great things. When you go home to your family, oh my goodness, sitting around the dinner table, loving on one another. In, in life, your endeavors, your service, your volunteering, my goodness, flowing with the Spirit of God, the anointing that you have that lives with you, stays with you, dwells with you, that teaches you all things, and that now teaches you how to live life in God. Did you guys get something from the word tonight? <laughs> Praise God. You know, when I talk about the anointing, when I talk about the Holy Spirit tonight, none of that applies if you're not a Christian. Now, we got to define what that means because a lot of times people think that, you know, just because they sit in a church service and call themselves a Christian, that that means that they're a Christian. A lot of times people think because they're born in America that America is the Christian nation and everybody born in America is a Christian. You know, you, you're not a Christian unless you eat apple pie and drive a Chevrolet and that sort of a thing. And, you know, as long as you're American, you're a Christian, you know, God and country. A lot of times people think, you know, if, I, if you're just a good person, that means that you're a Christian because you're good. God lets good people into heaven, and therefore, if you're going to go to heaven, if you're going to be a Christian, just do good stuff, you know, and, and, and you might be thinking, well, I've done good stuff. I've helped people out. I've given money to charities, gotten involved in social justice causes, and given money to the American Red Cross, and, you know, that sort of a thing, and, and been nice to my neighbors, really cool to people, and, and I've been really good, and I think, you know, God's going to let me into heaven because I've been good. I, I believe that I'm a Christian because I've been really good. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that because you sit in a church service and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because, you know, you warm up a seat in a sanctuary, that makes you a Christian. It's like me saying, I'm going to go to my garage, sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. Not going to work. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. No one in the Bible is to say America is the Christian nation to eat apple pie and drive a Chevrolet and God and country, that's all good. And, and if you believe that, then you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible is to say just be good. You know, that's kind of shocking to us. That kind of shocks our system. Wait a second, you mean God isn't interested in how good I am? Well, check it out. I don't see a grading scale in the Bible, be this good, you get to go to heaven. 
I don't see a curve or a line that you have to be above. Be this good or let your good outweigh your bad and that gets you into heaven. You know what the Bible does say about our goodness? It says that our goodness compared to God's goodness, if that's how we're trying to get into heaven, is like filthy rags. It's not going to measure up and it's going to get thrown out. Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by him. You know what that means? That means not all roads lead to heaven, contrary to what we've been taught. See, that's earthly wisdom. That's not the wisdom that comes from God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So that means if you want to be a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell, you can't get there any other way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And don't you think that God created the heavens and the earth? The one who wrote the plan of redemption carried it out in his son Jesus. Don't you think that after going to the cross, a beaten bloody mess, public spectacle for all to see. Don't you think that after he did all that, that if he desired for us to be with him that bad, then wouldn't he tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Jesus said this in John, the third chapter, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. But this is not about what society, Hollywood movies, television, books, or the internet say. Once again, that's the worldly system. What is the wisdom from God on being born again? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. The last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to the church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross and graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. Doing some of your things, some of God's thing, kind of playing your game doing your thing right in the fence. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. But listen, tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, Bang. That's your opportunity. You say, my opportunity? To do what? Well, simply raise your hand. Remember, we're doing this God's way. And the wisdom from God is this. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Romans, the 10th chapter, says, if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Now, that's not talking about a head knowledge because the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. They're not going to heaven. The devil can quote scriptures and knows who Jesus is. He's not a Christian. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And it says, he who believes unto righteousness. That's God's will, God's way. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So we're doing this God's way. You say, but wait a second. If I do that, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? You say, well, whoa, whoa, wait wait, wait a second, Pastor. Hell, isn't that like a fairy tale that parents made up to scare their children into being good? No, you can find hell in the Bible. Old Testament talks about it. New Testament talks about it. In fact, Jesus talked about it. It was never intended for you or me. Made for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And yet we can choose with our lives because God has given us the privilege to choose while we're here on the earth where we end up. We can either choose heaven or we can choose hell. It's our choice. God gives us the free will choice. And tonight, you have this opportunity. You can either choose to say, yeah, I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Or you can sit there and do nothing. You've made your choice. It's your call, your choice. I loved you enough tonight to tell you the truth. God loves you so much, he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him? all of your life. Who should raise their hand? Well, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, tonight is your night. Come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, come on. You can do that in a safe and friendly place. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're sitting there and you know you're lukewarm, 
That's the condition of your heart when I describe it. Get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out, watching by television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe, or online across the nation and around the world. Get ready to get your hand up. God sees and God notices right where you're at, what you're doing. And tonight, because of what I believe God wants to do, I'm going to make it easy on you. I'm going to pray with you right here in your seats. Is that cool? I'm going to lead you in a prayer right there in your seat. It's not going to call you forward, but I believe that God wants to do some things tonight in this service that I want to make sure that you're a part of. So just know, hey, this is easy night tonight. I, I ought to do this. This is really cool, you know, and this is your opportunity, okay? And so I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go all together. If you want to do this, you say, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. This is your moment. Get ready to raise your hand on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Come on, there's one, two, three, thank you. God bless you, where are you at? It's raised up high, four, got you right there. Four, five, thank you, six, over there. Seven, got you over there. Eight, God bless you. Nine, 10, 11, 12, got you over there. If I, if I got you, you can put your hands down. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? Got 12 wise people already, 13, God bless you. 14, got you right there, thank you. Who else tonight? 15, got you right there. Anybody else real quick? You're saying, I know I need to do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, God's speaking to you right now. That anointing. He's teaching you. Thank you. Thank you over there, number 16. God bless you. Who else tonight? You're saying, yeah, I, I, I just need to do this. I know I need to do this. Thank you. God bless you, number 17. Anybody else real quick? Come on, just raise it up high for me. You know that you feel the tug of the Spirit of God on your heart right now. Come on, respond to His voice. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I think I got you guys already. Thank you. Put your hands down. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? There's about 17 or 18 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. Now, let's do this. You raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. We're going to pray. So let's all stand in this place. And as we do, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you raised your hand and you said, yeah, I, I want to do that. I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. Or if you should have raised your hand, it's not too late. I want you to join in this prayer with me. In fact, everyone's going to join in. But remember, believe with your heart, confess with your mouth. So this is a heart thing. Put your heart on the Lord right now. And let's pray this prayer together. Come on, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to say these words out loud. Say, Father God. Come on, everybody say this. Say, Father God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. And I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. And now, Lord, make your home in me. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. And let it be known that from this day on, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Woo. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.